Okay. So, I'm going to be teaching you today about word studies. And we're going to be looking at a formal approach for doing a word study, which I think you'll find quite helpful. Now, one thing I want to say before we go any further is that all the slides from what I say during this week are available on my website that you can look at. And you need, all you need to do to go there is to go to the... Um, Go to the website loveintruth.com, loveintruth.com. If you just go there and there's a list of courses, and one of them is biblical interpretation. And so all of this material is there. And you can use it freely. If you want to reuse it in some way, then you can do that. Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. So, uh, so let's first of all ask the question, um, Actually, before we do that, let's talk about what we're doing in this course. Uh, part A, we're doing this time getting the most from a passage. Part B, which is the part that we're not doing this week, we're doing next semester, which is in variety where we understand different parts of the Bible, how we got the Bible, different translations, and lots of other good stuff. So this week, there are four assignments. They're all linked together, and you'll be one every day, and they're based on a passage of Scripture. I'll give each of you the scripture passage, and you'll write a paper on that passage, effectively, a little bit each day, in four parts as separate assignments. And so when I've taught this in the past, everyone's had a real blessing from their particular passage, because the idea is that not that I'm speaking to you, but God is speaking to you from this passage. And so uh, it's important to understand this is a Holy Spirit activity, although I'm giving you techniques that sometimes involve using a computer, you're still engaging with the Holy Spirit in this. And then there'll be a short test on the last day. Uh, as I said, everything is on the website. And uh, I'm going to create an account for you in the break on loveintruth.com because the way that we're going to do the assignments is you'll do your assignment, then you'll upload it directly from your computer into loveintruth.com. That way we don't have to worry about printing stuff out and me handing it in and printer not working and all those sorts of things that happen. So this morning we're going to ask what the need is for this course, talk about the basic method we're going to use and why, and then we're going to look at how to do a word study. So let's move on. Why do we need to study the Bible? Isn't it obvious how to understand the Bible? Well, it turns out that just about all the differences between Christians today hinge on this topic. You can look at every group from the most extreme conservative people that, that dress in a particular way and are very legalistic and, and uh, controlling to the wildest extreme and you'll find that they all claim to be based on the Bible. You won't, find, you won't go to a church and they say, oh, you know, we don't believe the Bible in this church. Well, you might if it's uh, some, a Muslim mosque or something, but if it, if it claims to be a church, claims to be Christian, they will all claim to believe the Bible. Isn't that right? So the question is, how can you get from the Bible to there? I mean, even Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons claim to believe the Bible. So how do you get from where they are to the Bible? And so uh, actually the question about how you interpret the Bible is, is one of the most important questions. You get that wrong and everything's wrong. And so wrong interpretation is behind legalism, behind denial that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are active today, uh, behind unhealthy church structures where there's abuse in the church structure uh, and other kinds of abusive churches, behind cults, behind weirdness, or just getting unbalanced and sidetracked into emphasizing odd things and losing the main plot. I mean, without wanting to be rude about any particular group, um, snake handling. Okay, there is one passage of scripture that says that you can handle snakes, you know, that, that, that snake, you can be bitten by snakes and uh, it won't be, um, you won't be uh, 
killed by it as you know, one of the things that, it actually doesn't say that that will happen to you, but it describes that as one of the miracles that will follow, one of the supernatural. So, and that happened once to Apostle Paul, who was bent by a snake and he didn't die. But to turn that into the main thing that your church is identified by, you know, you handle poisonous snakes, is maybe a, 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 a somewhat of an imbalance in how you approach scripture. So, and this can tend to happen. People will seize on one little thing and they'll turn that into the main thing. So it's not just about being theologically correct, though. It's actually a lot more than that. It's about hearing God accurately. And it's about submission to him. You can't really submit to God's will unless you hear what he says. If you're listening to God through a grid that only allows him to speak in a particular way, then you're not going to be hear his voice. So it's about being set free by the truth he speaks into our hearts and a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit since he wrote the Bible. Supposing you're, you're uh, uh, in a relationship with, with somebody and you're, you're uh, deepening that relationship, but you can over, only ever speak to them on the phone and they're living in another country and the phone line is really, really bad. You can hardly hear what they're saying when you're speaking to them. It's going to be frustrating, isn't it? And it's going to hinder the development of your relationship. And so it's the same with the Holy Spirit. He's written us the scriptures. If we can have more clarity in, in, in hearing it, we can deeper deepen our relationship with him. Okay. So um, uh, just one thing about hearing God accurately about submission. Um, we often tend to impose a grid over the scriptures. We have our particular set of beliefs, and when we read the scriptures, we, we're only willing to hear what they're saying within our grid. Okay, and so that, because of that, we are not really hearing what God says. Now, let me give you an example of this. And we all believe in grace, don't we? We all believe that it's not about our performance, it's about God's love for us, and uh, we... we, uh, we we keep his commands because we love him, not because uh, he's going to judge us because Jesus has already paid the price for all of our sin. Now, there's one particular extreme grace movement that has so kind of gone against legalism, they would say, well, there's actually no commands. There aren't any commands for a Christian. And so if there are no commands for a Christian, then what, was, what about what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount? When Jesus said, you know, uh, things like, um, if you, you know, you must look lustfully on a woman, or if you, if you, uh, if you um, hate somebody, it's like murdering them, things like that. They would say, well, if, since there aren't any commands for Christians, that can't apply to Christians. So Jesus' teaching cannot apply to Christians. So some of you are looking, oh, that doesn't sound right. Well, how can you get to that? Because you've imposed a theological grid on things, and that is the grid you're going to read everything by. And so you can't really submit to God because you're not really hearing him. So when Jesus is speaking, you're not really hearing what he's saying because you've already decided that Jesus can't possibly say this because God wouldn't do this. To, uh, and so, so it's actually, if you really want to hear God, what God is saying, you have to clear some of this junk away and allow him to speak directly to you. Now, all of us have got our grids. This is the problem. And the thing that you can't see is your own grid. You know, we can't see them by definition because they are like in front of our eyes. But what we're going to do this week is hopefully to to do some clearing to enable us to be better at detecting where we've got stuff that's in the way of hearing God. Does that make sense? Uh, if you've got any questions, I like having lots of interactions, so just, uh, uh, just say what you... You can either interrupt me or raise your hand or whatever and we can, we can talk about that. All right, so... Um, now the phrase word and spirit, it's a, it's a great concept. Uh, you have the, the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of the scriptures. And that's what we're about really, isn't it? We want to have the both of them. We want to we wanna not just say we want God's power, but we want God's truth as well. Um, the only problem with that is that, although I agree with the idea, the phrase word and spirit suggests that somehow word is different to spirit, but actually it's the spirit's words so you could say it's the Spirit's words and it's the Spirit's power. You could say that. Um, so this is how I like to think of it. Um, a, a few years ago, I, 
I was thinking in a word and spirit, maybe I can go through the New Testament and I can find all the places where the Spirit refers to power and all the places where the Spirit refers to truth. Because Jesus says, when the Spirit comes, he will lead you into all truth. So there's a lot of verses like that. And when I went through, I discovered there was another whole lot of words about the Spirit to do with love, to do with, with bringing relationship and love for one another. And so actually, there are three main streams that the Spirit brings to us. And so he's the Spirit of love, and there's some references there. I'm not going to go through them, but you can look them if you want to. So he's the Spirit of love, he's the Spirit of truth, and he's the Spirit of power. And so uh, an example with all three would be 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So um, what I would like to to think of then is rather than saying word and spirit to say it's all the spirit but it's truth and it's power and so we want to have both of those and of course love so actually I think the sequence with those three because God pours his love into our hearts that's the first thing it begins with God's love um, by the spirit so we, know, we love him because he first loved us the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us so that's how it starts the next thing that happens is he sets us free by the truth. The words that I speak to you are spirit, they are life. So we receive the love of God. He then sets us free with the truth. And then when we speak the truth and start living in the truth, he comes in with supernatural power. And so there's a good example in Acts 14.3 when Paul and his friends are... Uh, they're on a missionary journey and it says they may they remain for a long time speaking boldly for the Lord. So that's truth. That's the truth of the Spirit. Who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So as they began to preach the truth, God said, yes, I like that truth. I'm going to back that up with signs and wonders. And uh, another example would be in Hebrews 2, 4. God confirmed their witness with signs and wonders and faithful and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. So in both of these, you get truth and power linked together. As they spoke the truth, the power came as God validated what that truth was. So if we want more of the power of the Spirit, we, we, we must have the other things. We can't demand the Holy Spirit, he's the Spirit of power, but not be interested in him as the Spirit of love and truth. He doesn't want us to divide him up. Can you imagine um, a guy and he's, he's interested in a girl and he says, you know, I love your beauty. I'm not interested in your mind, but you're just so beautiful. How is she going to react to that? Not very well. So we don't say to the Holy Spirit, you know, I just love your power. You know, that book you wrote, I'm not that interested in it. I'm just, yeah, but it's your power that I want. He's not going to be that interested in it, in us. What he wants us to 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 embrace all that he has for us. And those are the three things. We love one another. He's the spirit of love. That's what comes first. We receive the love of the Father and we show it to others. And then we're set free by the truth and we live by the truth and the truth transforms us. And then we want his power to do the signs and wonders and to spread his kingdom. So, I, so I'm giving you this because I think sometimes we misunderstand the role of truth and we think truth is a little bit like dental hygiene. You know, you floss regularly and you, you won't get bad teeth. And, you know, as long as you, you have enough truth, it prevents you getting unhealthy. But actually, it's not that. It's the, it's the lifeblood of the three things that God wants for us. And we don't say, well, I'm more interested in this and this because they're a package. They come together. And so if we want more signs and wonders, we need to... We need to be people of love and we need to be people of truth. Those, those things go together. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, so if you want more of his power in your life, then this course is for you. Now, of course, this is only part of the picture. I'm not going to suggest that simply taking this course is going to impart mighty signs and wonders to you, but it's part of the big picture of what God wants for your life. So that's uh, the reason for, for this, for why we study this, this topic. So what I'd like to do now is to talk about words, talk about words. And now we're going to switch into some material, which is um, probably the more um, mechanical end of things. Um, 
as we go through this week, we'll start off with the, the, really the nuts and bolts and we'll build up to more of sort of conceptual levels and more of the, the theology, but it's very much nuts and bolts. So some of the things I'm going to be doing now would be exactly the same that you would get if you were taking a university course on linguistics. It's not different material, but it's, it's, it's truth and it's very valuable. So the first point, I'm going to give you several points on linguistics. The first point is that it's not necessary to study the history of a word to understand its meaning. Um, linguists use two terms for types of study. And you needn't remember these terms, but one of them is synchronic. That means one given point in time, e.g. English spoken in the year 2003, for example. The other would be diachronic historical study of the change and development of the language. So uh, originally it was thought that to study a language you had to study the history of the language, how it came up to, that, to be at that point. And that has been shown to be completely false. You don't actually need to know anything about the history of the language to understand that language. Um, what you need to know is how people use that language at the time. So. Uh, so, for example, the word like has taken on a, a big connotation in the last three or four years. What's the connotation it's taken on that it was never used before? That's right. That's right. Okay. I actually was thinking of something people use on computers when they like something. What does it mean to like something? But you're completely right. But what does it mean to like something? Are you enjoying it? Yeah. It? Yeah. But it's generally, it's like Facebook, isn't it? It's like you say, I like that. It's like, it's, it's become something that is like plus one. You know, I'm going to add a like to that. Now, um, that's, that's never happened before in history, that that particular usage has come about, and it's become about because of this. But if, if you wanted to know what it meant to push the like button on Facebook, it wouldn't help you to study what Shakespeare meant by like, or what early English writing, it wouldn't help you in the slightest bit, because it's changed. And what you need to do is to study how it's used right now, how it's used by this group or this by the group by, or this group. And like what you said about people putting like into the sentence just as like a filler word, as I did just then. <laughs> as like, a, like I'm trying to find like other words like to put in and like instead of saying I'm um, like, I say like. So it's a filler word. So people are using it like that. The word is used to understand then what like means. You find lots of examples of it now. And you say, what are the patterns that people use it? How do people tend to use it? You don't need to go back. This is of great help because it means when we're studying the New Testament, we don't have to go back into ancient history and trace some rare documents to find out what it meant. Um, okay, so that's the first point. And that's something that's recognized now in linguistics. And it's going to be a help to us as we, as we look in a minute the second is that language is a system. What do I mean by that? It's not a bag of bits and pieces. Words doesn't, don't have a meaning that's absolute, but only in relationship to other words. Now, I want to take an example. The word board, uh, how, many use, how, many, how many different meanings does the word board have? Now, you can see there it says 10 according to dictionary. But can you think of a, a meaning for the word board? What does it mean, board? Okay, a board of wood. Okay, a piece of wood, yes. What else? A surfboard, yep. A group of people, okay. So what specific kind of group of people? Like directors or something like that, you're thinking? Yeah, yep, yep, that's right, yep. Okay, that's good. What else? Boarding a ship, that's right, all aboard. Yeah, that's good. What else? You could say that's spelled slightly differently, but you could say board. Uh, another, when, you, when, you're, when you're paying for accommodation, you may pay for room and board. OK. Um, also, sometimes, and this is a little bit related to that, sometimes uh, the, particularly poetically, people describe 
a table of richly laden with food as, as board. You know, the board, the, it was um, laden, the board was laden or something like that. It's more of a poetic type of thing. Uh, so, and there are some other ones that we could look at, but there, there, there are a lot of meanings. So how do you know which one you're using at that time? By its relationship to other words around it. So if I say board of directors, the word of directors defines what that particular word means. So words, we tend to think of words as, as separate units, but actually they're not. They're just, they, they relate to other words and the language is a system. The other thing is that um, words tend to shift in meaning and words disappear and appear in language. So the word fundamentalist. Now, fundam would you, anybody here like to be described as a fundamentalist? Probably not, because it tends to mean, uh, well, what does fundamentalist mean now? If I was to say he's a, somebody's a fundamentalist Muslim, what would it mean? Extremist. Yes, it, means ex it would mean extremist, that's right. Now, do you know what it meant originally? Fundamentalist was a term invented by Christians around the uh, end of the 1800s when there was, uh, p there was a lot of doubt on the truth of the Bible and some of the major denominations were doubting that the Bible was really God's word and in fact anything supernatural. And so a group of people said we're going to come up, we're going to come with the fundamentals of the faith which the Bible is God's word, uh, that God exists in three persons, Jesus is both God and man, and you have to be born again, something like that. There were, I can't remember how many, there were a few things. And they said, these are the fundamentals of the faith. If you don't believe these, you can't call yourself a Christian. And if you, if you, if you declare you believe in this, you're a fundamentalist. Okay? So it just meant a real Christian. But what happened then, the word tended to be used by groups who were becoming more and more, I guess, conservative and locked into a particular set of beliefs. And so the word drifted in its meaning, and now it's got almost a wholly negative connotation. There may be some people who would take it to themselves, but not many. So we have to invent a new word. So what word would you use to describe somebody that's a real Christian, or not somebody that just uses it as a label? What word would you use? You could use spirit-filled. One word that, that was popular is a born-again Christian, but then that has become sort of not really meaning very much now. Um, yeah, uh, one word that is, um, that's a quite interesting word, and I think it's quite good, is to say Christ follower, rather than to say Christian. Because Christ follower said, well, for one thing, it doesn't have a negative baggage, because people are critical of Christians, you know, Christians are hypocrites and something. And so if somebody is, is a, if somebody's talking to me about how hypocritical Christians are, I say, well, you know what? If they were real Christ followers, they wouldn't be doing that, would they? And the person says, no, they wouldn't. <laughs> you see, because everybody agrees. There are not many people that would say Christ was hypocritical. So if you define somebody as being a Christ follower, a real Christ follower, a genuine Christ follower, then you, you get round some of those problems. So uh, uh, that's a, a phrase that Bill Hybels uses and other people use it um, to define Christians. And it's helpful because it defines it in terms of a category of life rather than just a label. But maybe Christ follower will become a word that has negative connotation. We'll have to invent a new one. Uh, so, um, so words are constantly moving around and changing. Um, so uh, the, what, what did the word gay used to mean? Happy. Yeah, right, without a care in the world. So um, another word that changed its meaning is um, the word um, phileo which meant um, in Jesus' time, it meant to, to, be a to, to be a friend, to love somebody, to be, to be affectionate towards them. Now, this affection, after the New Testament was written, it went through a transition where it began to mean to kiss somebody, and it began to take on some slightly erotic sy symbolism. And so, people could no longer use phileo if they just meant something as an innocent, innocent uh, affection for a person and so other words had to come in and this tends to happen in languages people use euphemisms they don't want to say something directly they, they use an indirect word and then the indirect word actually becomes the direct word another example would be um, almost most countries 
when they want to talk about going to the bathroom or the restroom or whatever, don't say it directly. You know, in England, you say I'm going to the loo. In the US, you say I'm going to go to the restroom. In Canada, it's going to the bathroom or the washroom, rather. And, uh, and so we all say something. But what happens is um, nobody wants to say going to the toilet because that sounds well. But actually, toilet was the French for washing. So originally, to go to the toilet meant going to wash. And so that was a euphemism, but then that becomes something you wouldn't want to say in polite company. And so we invent another word, and then eventually that becomes something that's sullied and used in, used in polite company. So language is constantly undergoing this transition. So what you need to do when you're studying language is to say, to pick a point in time, and actually not just a point in time, but a cultural unit. So, for example, how is it used in the United States of America in 2011 or, or in... Um, in Quebec in you know, 1995 or whatever, how is it used? And um, we, f fortunately, that's something that we can do because um, uh, not long after the New Testament was written, we, get, we have a lot of letters that the church fathers wrote to one another. It's called patristic lit literature because it's the church fathers. It really just means the... Um, the, the leaders of the church at that time. There are a lot of letters that they wrote. We've got this large body of literature. And we can see exactly how they used words because they would often quote scripture in what they're writing and we can see what they understood by the words they were using. And so probably the most useful thing, apart from the scriptures themselves, the scriptures themselves are the best commentary because they are pretty much all written at the same time. I'm talking about the New Testament here. Pretty much written at the same time. Um, but shortly after that, we have all these other writings. And so this enables us to take a slice of writings at the time. We do have a lot of ancient Greek stuff, but it's not always relevant because it's not, the words aren't always used the same. And of course, Greek today has changed so much that it's not a lot of help in understanding what New Testament Greek meant. So, um, two types of relationships. Uh, with, with words. They've got a horizontal relationship within a sentence. So uh, the love of God is manifest in Christ. The word love has a precise meaning in the context of that sentence because the sentence makes it specific. I, I, love is a very general word. Love can mean so many different things. But when in this sentence it's the love of God, which makes it much more specific, but also it's the love of God manifest in Christ. And so that ties that particular word down. And that's, if you, that's the horizontal relationship. It's, it's relating to the other words that are in there. Um, the second thing is the choice of, to use one word excludes another word. If, um, if I was to be describing somebody and I said, um, they're a fairly good friend. Now, if I were to say that, you would probably think, he's deliberately chosen not to say they're a very good friend. So there's something significant about that. So whenever I choose to use a word, I'm making a cho choice not to use other words, and I have a range of words that I could use. So in, in England, there's a large range of words for describing rain, different kinds of rain. You could say, you know, it was, it was uh, showers, or it was drizzle, or it was spitting, or it was... Lots of different words. And so if somebody said um, it, was, uh, it was spitting, that's just little drops of rain every so often, then they've made a choice to say it wasn't a storm, for example. And so when you're reading that, you have to say, what is this per particular person's vocabulary? If that person is from a place where it doesn't rain very much, then they may not use very many different words for rain. But if they've got a wide vocabulary and they choose one particular word, then that's significant. So in this particular phrase, he could have said, the mercy of God is manifested in Christ. He could have said that. Or he could have used another word. So the choice is the love of God that's chosen there, which is important. And it's, it's something that can be very helpful. So choosing one word automatically excludes the others. So Paul could have said the love and mercy of God if he'd wanted to say both. And that's one of the problems with the Amplified Bible, that it can sometimes give you all kinds of options which are not really uh, possible within that framework. 
Um, a good translation will, will take all of these things into consideration when choosing what, how to translate the word. Okay, point three in linguistics is the distinction between a language and an individual's use of that language. So a language is a complex system, verbs, nouns, and whatever, but every individual uses their language in a unique way. I remember hearing a, a court case um, of uh, uh, a, a trial where one of the witnesses was Jamaican, and she'd said something like, I usually, I usually shop in that store on Wednesdays. And the, the, uh, in the trial, the prosecution, the, the defense had said, well, that just means that she usually does it, but she didn't necessarily do it on that day. But actually, this, in the Jamaican use of English, if you say, I usually do it, it means you always do it. That's just Jamaican English. You always do it. That's what, how they use the word usually. So an individual's use of the language is different to, uh, to the language as a whole. So Kevin might have a particular phrase that he uses. Um, that I, that, uh, that I, because I know Kevin, I know what he means by that. And so it's the same with the New Testament writers. They might have a particular phrase that they use, and we know what they mean by that because we are familiar with that person's writing. So, so an example of that would be John. As we read John's Gospel, John's Epistles, the book of Revelation, we'll see that he uses black and white terms. You're either of the truth or you're a liar. And sometimes they're going to be very, very stark until we understand that that's how John expresses himself. Sometimes John will throw out something really stark and then he will start to explain what he means by that. That's just the way he does it. And he's not ex intending us originally to, to take it, it exactly how he says it to start with because he's intending us to then read on and allow him to define how it works. So if somebody sins, then are they of the devil? Well, then John says, well, you know, if you say that you, you don't sin, then you're a liar because everybody sins, but we have an advocate with the Father. So John clearly can't be saying that we don't sin. So when you read John, you have to be sensitive to, to John's style, that he likes to shock you with a phrase and then really develop it. So James uses faith a little differently to Paul. Um, for Paul, obedience is part of faith. Faith isn't just sign that something that, that, that happens in your head and uh, it's a conceptual thing. So to speak about a work, faith without works for Paul would be like speaking about life without a heartbeat. He wouldn't, he's, when Paul says faith, he's not imagining faith without works. But James then is responding to a, le a little later than that when people have taken Paul and they've said, okay, if all I need is faith, I needn't bother to do anything. And they've, they've reduced faith to something which is just a mental assent. And so something that's uh, an intellectual belief that is true that even demons can have. And uh, his conclusion is the same as Paul, but he expresses with, it with words that have a different nuance. So, uh, so <clears throat> for James, he can say faith without works is dead because he's assuming people can use the word faith in a very abstract, mental concept. Whereas for Paul, faith without works would be meaningless because faith is something which is always expressed. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I mean, you can never find, if you search Paul's writings, you'll never find him using faith in a way that could be, the demons could have. Because it's always something that's, it begins and ends the book of Romans by talking about the obedience of faith. So, when John says, abide in Christ, it's virtually identical to Paul saying, in Christ. In Christ is the most common phrase in Paul. Uh, it's his description for a Christian. He doesn't say the word Christian, they hadn't really used that yet. So, he would say, you know, is that person in Christ? Or, you know, I'm in Christ, or whatever. It's his common phrase. But we don't find it in the other writings, but we find equivalents. John, in the Gospel, talks about abiding in Christ. Abide in me branch and the vine and the branches. Okay, so those are some, some principles of linguistics. Anybody got any questions on that? Comments, thoughts, ideas? Okay. 
Exactly online, yeah. You can print them out, yeah. 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 So I'm going to now look um, at, just go back over some of this material in a bit more detail. What is a word? So a definition, a word is a unit of language that has meaning. So thoughts are expressed of words when they're put together in a certain relationship. Many words do not have identical meaning in all contexts. Now we looked at board earlier, now I'm going to look at trunk. A trunk can be a box to put clothes in. It can be the long nose of an elephant. It can be the luggage space in a car if you're not English. And uh, uh, a light can be the opposite of darkness. It can mean, it's, I can say, oh, that's a light, a light shirt you're wearing. And I mean it's light in color. Or I could mean it's light in weight. Or I can mean, I can say, uh, have you, uh, could you, uh, do you have a light? It's dark in here, do you have a light? Or actually somebody who's smoking could say, do you have a light, meaning something to light the cigarette with. So light then uh, has a different meaning in different contexts. But, it, uh, and as I said earlier, the, the, there's a, 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 it's not useful to look at the history of the word. And I'm going to give you an example of that. The word nice. The word nice, in the 1300s, the word nice meant ignorant and foolish. So if I was to say um, Amy's a nice person, it would mean she's an ignorant and foolish person in the 1300s. So that's what it meant. In the 1800s, it could mean the word, uh, it was used with the meaning of precisely. Um, I believe it was Franklin, the explorer, was criticized for being nice and the, when you look at it, he was because he was very precise and exacting in his demands, that he was a nice man. So it was to actually, you, things were done carefully and uh, precisely. But in the 2000s, it generally just means generally pleasant, doesn't it? If I say Amy's a nice person. Sorry? Yeah, nice, nice. Yeah. It is, yes. It's not a strong word for saying something. In fact, it could, if you said, how was your day yesterday? And you said, it was nice. It be yeah, it could be almost negative, yeah. I've heard people be like, oh, that's nice. In other words, that's unpleasant, but that was inappropriate. That's right, sarcastically, yeah. that's right. So. so, however, to understand it today, you don't need to know anything. It's not going to help you to know this or this. It's not going to help you. Uh, you need to, but it is going to help you if you hear a lot of different people today using it and you think about the way they're using it. So um, we can get um, misunderstandings um, if we try and do this. Uh, let me just, um, I, yeah, let, let me uh, just give you an example. In the, when the King James was translated, the King James Version in, in 1611, uh, that's f there's been 500 years, 400 years of development of language since then. And people will quite often misunderstand something in the King James. And there's one example where actually you, people take the opposite. In, um, in um, Genesis, where Abraham sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac, the King James said, I being in the way, the Lord led me, describing the servant says this, I being in the way, the Lord led me. Now, originally that meant the way was the road. They were called a, 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 a road away. So he says, I'm, I was on the road and God led me. Okay. But being in the way now means you're obstructing, doesn't it? And so people have taken that verse and say, if you want to be led by God, get in the way. And then God will lead you which is the opposite to what it's saying. What he's saying is, I just headed down the road. I just headed off, and as I was going, God led me. He's not saying I just stopped and blocked whatever was happening and then got, uh, caused God to lead me. So, um, so that's an example of just having to be having a problem when we have a Bible translation that's translated uh, to English 400 years ago when there may be some uh, differences. Um, <coughs> so sometimes biblical words... Uh, have a new distorted meaning now. So Apple computer employs evangelists. An evangelist is to, to spread the gospel according to Steve Jobs. Well, I guess it's not Steve Jobs anymore, but you know what I mean. It's to kind of to go around and they call them evangelists. That's what they call them. And um, because they're to spread the good news of the company. So it tends to, to, 
there's a, there's a distortion happening in our culture. We've got to be careful when we're using biblical words that we're really communicating what we need to. Uh, and then, of course, there's inflation of a word. What does the word awesome mean? Yeah, originally it was like a mountain range. Wow, that is awesome. What does it mean now? It could do. It could mean it was good. Um, but I remember uh, at a conference, somebody saying from the, from the platform, uh, if you would put your empty water bottles in the garbage, that would be awesome. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we get an inflation of words, and we need to be sensitive to that in the way that words. Are. So that's just an introduction to words, and now I would like to look at um, Esword. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to talk about yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so, how do we like read the Bible? If if the translations we're reading were translated so long ago, then how can we trust it, right? How okay. Okay. So this is a good question. If the translations we're reading were translated so long ago, how can we trust it? It's a good question. Well. They're not, we don't use a translation that was done so long ago. Use a modern translation. That's the simplest thing. Um, well, I use uh, two translations, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but I use, the, I use the ESV and the Net Bible. The ESV for more of a kind of a, uh, uh, an accurate literal interpretation. The Net Bible, similar to the NIV, a very kind of more of a, a, sort of a, a fresh, um, dynamic translation. So we've got lots of translations that have been done in the last 20 years. No problem with that. You know, the, a lot of them are updated on a regular basis, like the NIV is updated. Um, the New King James has had some updates. Um, the ESV has only been out for, you know, five years or so, maybe more than that, maybe 10 years, but it's very new. The message hasn't been out that long. Um, so... Uh, I would say we actually need, I mean, it's a very good question because what it's saying is we need to be constantly revising our translations. We need to be. It's a very important thing. We need to be sensitive to this. Now, it's not quite as bad as you might think because um, uh, although, some, although words do change their meanings, you can usually understand a more conventional meaning. So if I was to use like in an old sense and I was to say, I really like that painting over there you're going to know what I mean. So it's not quite as bad. If I was to go back 100 years and say, it's a nice painting, meaning it was precise, then you're going to misunderstand me. But it, it's, um, it's, uh, it, it is important, though, that I believe that we use a translation that's, that's more, particularly if we're trying to reach people who aren't Christians and don't know the, the basic stuff. I mean, you know what God's love means. But somebody who's not a Christian and hasn't come across that before, you've got to be more careful how you use your words. So I'm, I would be very concerned with evangelistic literature that we use, we think very carefully, how is this going to be understood in our culture? What are people going to make of this? Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> actually, I'm going to think I've just missed something. Let me just... Uh, Okay, um, okay. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, what we should consider when we were determining the meaning of a word in a biblical passage. So let's get down to some practicalities here. Um, so, as you've already gathered, the context controls what the word means. So, um, we've, supposing we've got the word lion. Um, what does lion symbolize in the Bible? Well, you might immediately say, the lion of the house of Judah, it's, it's Jesus Christ. But actually, you have to look at the context. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, so, what, so what qualities of a, a lion are being emphasized? Maybe a lion's hungry, the destructive side of a lion. 
But then we have, behold, the lion, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Uh, Jesus is the lion. So here the lion is the king, royal power, authority. So uh, the context then of that word is important. And we can't just draw a line. Sometimes people make it almost like a dictionary of prophetic words in the scripture. And this word always means this, and this means this. And you can't really do that. You'd have to look at the context. There are words that are frequently meant in a particular way. When I do a course on Revelation, we talk about that, how there are some things. So, for example, serpents usually don't mean something positive in prophetic. You know, usually when there's a serpent, it's something. It's to do with Satan. Um, but... A lot of other words, uh, you, you've got to be careful you don't, for example, always say oil is the Holy Spirit or you can get into some troubles. Um, words can have a range of meanings. So uh, the word sleep in 1 Thessalonians 5.10, those who sleep, sleep at night, refers to physical sleep. And then verse 6 says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch. So that's saying, Christian, not saying Christians must never sleep at night is it? Well, here it's saying, those who sleep, sleep at night. Here it's saying, let's not sleep. So it's being unaware. But then in verse 10, it says, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So it's referring to death. You know, whether I, I wake or sleep, in other words, whether I'm alive or dead, then I'm for God. Um, and so um, in these verses, these four verses, there are three different meanings for sleep used. One of them literal, two of them a metaphors. A metaphor, you're sleepy, you're not paying attention, or somebody's fallen asleep, in fact they've died. So the technical word for this is a semantic field. And I'm just going to uh, draw us a little sketch of what I mean here. So what we have, for, I, and I hope you guys can see it, I'll try and draw it over this side. Can you see this here? Okay. So what we have is a, a range of possible meanings for the word sleep. So the word could mean up here, it can mean a literal sleep. Uh, or down here it could mean being um, inattentive. Or you could say somebody, wake up! And you don't mean they're actually asleep, you just mean they're not paying attention. Or here it could mean they've fallen asleep. You might see in a gravestone, this person fell asleep on January the 1st, 1971. And it doesn't mean to say they literally just went to bed. So this, and this is the semantic field. Now what that means is, it doesn't have cows in it, it has words in it. And those words could mean anything that within that. And a word can't mean something outside of its field, but it can mean something within its field. So the one we had earlier, board, has got a big semantic field and with uh, lots of possible meanings that it can have. And that, those are the, that's the field of meanings. Now what we find is that words have got um, fields that overlap. So if I say nice, nice has got a huge semantic field. It can mean a lot of things. But if I said um, something like um, delightful, then that was probably a smaller field within that, because if something's delightful, then it's nice. But if something's nice, it's not necessarily delightful. Then I might say, what would be a stronger word than delightful if you liked something? Brilliant. brilliant. Okay, particularly if you're English. So brilliant could be within, within there. So brilliant is a stronger word. So sometimes words can go within words. Sometimes they can overlap with words. So you could say something could be nice and, um, give me another word, sort of like nice, a general word. Great. Great. Okay, that's great. I just said it, didn't I? I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> okay, right. So, so great. Something could be great and nice, can't it? But something could be, you could say, you could say, um, uh, you could say that Hitler was one of the greatest fascist leaders that we've, the world has seen. You don't mean to say he's nice. You're just great in a sense of being, like, significant. Yeah. Okay? Uh, so, or something could be nice without being great. I mean, you could say, Amy's nice, but Amy's not yet great. 
so you could say, well, you could say she's great with child, but that would be a very, a very, a very big, uh, that would be the old King James description of when somebody's pregnant. They would, that's how they would use it. Anyway, so do you get the idea? So we have this overlap. Now I'm going to use a particular example, and that's the word for love. And uh, do you know how many words for love there are in the New Testament? Or in Greek? There are. You can argue there were four, but the fourth is kind of rather um, an edge case. So the main, what's, what's a word for love? Hmm? Agape. Yes. Uh, the verb will be agapeo. So uh, if I put this word, agapeo. So here's a word for love. Now, do you know another word? Phileo. Phileo. Yes, right. So... Um, okay, and uh, another word, the eros, yes, that's a, it's a noun rather than a verb. So, I'm going to wait just a minute before I put that in. All right, so agapao, um, agapao means um, a love which is not expecting anything in return. So if you were to go down the street and see somebody lying on the side and they haven't eaten for days and you gave them some food, that would be agapao. So it's not expecting anything in return. Um, phileo is uh, a, a word where you're enjoying the relationship. Okay. So you're getting something back. You, you, just, you just love being with that person. They're your friend. Okay. So... Uh, in a husband and wife situation, which is it? Yeah, is there any agapao in a husband and wife situation? Yeah, there is, actually. There is. You don't just love the person because you're getting something back. There's actually both. And so we could say, we could say probably that in most situations, almost all situations, that it would be like that. I mean, it's possible you might consider somebody you might really enjoy somebody but not be willing to do anything for them so I'm going to leave a little bit there but generally speaking phileo is a special case if agapao is a general giving to somebody phileo is when you're actually enjoying it and you're getting something back okay so and within a marriage you would expect to be here when you're getting both of them now what about eros eros is a sexual love so where does eros fit in here is it possible to have eros without phileo? Okay. Not authentically. I guess you could say you could have a kind of a lustful. Uh, so, but generally speaking, let's say we're defining it in terms, in terms of how things should be. You'd actually have it inside of here. So, so you shouldn't say. Uh, is a love this or this or this, but actually, because it's all three. Because actually, it's a special case of phileo. Eros is not just a, a normal phileo, but it's a phileo that has got that sexual overtone on it as well. Okay. Exactly. So what you're saying is there could be, it's possible, if we're looking at lust, it's possible that you could have maybe... Uh, we ought to extend it out here, like that. So here would be like a, a, a lustful uh, a attitude there, which would be um, not including... That's right, yes. Okay, so this is important because um, when we look at uh, the Gospel of John, we see that John uses, the, he uses these two words quite a bit. Um, if he just wants to say love and is really not being specific about what kind of love it is, he's just saying love. So he says the father loves the son. He would use agapao. So the neutral word that doesn't have any connotation at all um, suppose is just agapao. That's what it is. That's the, now, if, so, so often we read too much into it. We say, um, if it says the father loves the son and it's agapao, we shouldn't say, well, that means the father's love for the son is not 
expecting anything in return or enjoying anything because that's not, you're putting too much into it. That's just like if he wants to say it, you'd have to look at the context to make a special case that this is a love that wasn't expecting anything in return. Do you get that? Okay. But in any particular point, if he chooses to use phileo, then he's made a choice. This is his normal word. So you can say with John, John usually uses akapao. When you, John uses phileo, he's chosen to use phileo. This is why it's so significant that God, John, that Jesus says that I, my father will love you with a phileo love. That is so significant because John is particularly choosing that word as over against agapao. He's saying he will love you, not just because he's chosen you. Like when God so loved the world, it's agapao. He's loved the world. He's not necessarily expecting anything in return. But when he says phileo, my father will love you, he's chosen to say that he will enjoy that relationship with you. It will bring him pleasure. It's a love of friendship, not just a love of giving. Does that make sense? The fourth word is a word that's referred to family love, and it's only ever used in a negative sense to refer to people that have lost all family affection. It's not a common word that's used there. It's only used once in a, in a negative sense. Yes, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't really build a big case on that. Okay, so... Um, that's, so that's to give you a little example of what I mean by semantic fields and how the semantic fields can overlap. And so we, I've tried to put together some of the ideas that we've been talking about here. Um, the idea of a field as a range of meanings, the idea of the context of the field in terms of the person who's speaking, the John. So how does John use these words? Does, what does John mean? And when we do our word studies, this is one of the things we're going to be able to get a handle on very easily, how a particular person uses a word. And uh, then when we see that, this is going to help us to determine what choice that person had. Do they use, is this a common word that they use? And what range of meanings do they have for this word? So. Okay, so the other th thing that we can point out is that different words can have the same or similar meaning. So you can have two words which are actually the synonyms, in other words they're very similar, or homonyms, meaning they're, they're the same. Um, there we go. Actually this homonym means like something slightly different. Um, so here we have an example. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then in Mark 1, the same equivalent passage in Mark, the same event, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Which did Jesus say? Did she say the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God? Well, he may have used both phrases. And uh, essentially, they have the same meaning. So why does Matthew say kingdom of heaven and, and uh, Mark say kingdom of God? Jesus probably used both. Matthew's chosen to report the times that he used kingdom of heaven. Well, uh, pro the most probable reason is that Matthew was written to Jews, and he didn't want to offend the Jews unnecessarily. And the Jews, um, in the time of Jesus were uneasy about writing the name of God or speaking the name of God. So they developed a technique for Yahweh, or saying the name of Yahweh, where they would substitute it for Adonai when they said it, which means just means, um, means Lord. And uh, so they were uncomfortable with saying God, and so he is substituted king of the kingdom of heaven, not because putting words into Jesus' mouth, but he just chosen to report that particular time. Now, some people have tried to build a theology on this, and they said, you know, there's the kingdom of God and there's the kingdom of heaven, and they're two different things. And uh, it just makes a nonsense of it. They really haven't understood how the words are used there. You just can't do that. You can't build some theology on that. Um, so, so synonyms give expression to different shades of meaning. They make a language capable of expressing more precisely something, give different nuances. So here we go. 
an example. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to the Lord. So look at the different words for prayer. There's prayer, there's supplication, there's thanksgiving, and there's requests. They're all prayer terms. Why didn't you just say prayer? Why didn't you just say be anxious for nothing, pray to God? Because he could have. That was the choice. Why did he put all those words in? Yeah, exactly. Exa is that what I've said there? Oh. Sorry. You know, I need to modify this not to put all the answers in. I, I used to not put the answers in, and then I made my, my notes the same as the notes I show here, and they've got the... Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, Kevin. Brilliant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So... You get the picture. If he just put prayer, we'd have said, oh yeah, prayer's good. But what he said is, okay, um, don't be anxious, but like go for the whole thing in prayer. Don't hold back. You must thank God, bring requests, pray for other people, all of these things. And so it's more powerful, but also um, richer than just stating it. Now, when we're reading that, we don't say uh, supplication. Well, that's just prayer. Thanksgiving, yeah, that's prayer as well. Request, well, that's prayer. We don't say, well, it's just all prayer. We actually say, if you're studying this passage, you say, okay, he wouldn't have used four different words if he didn't want to actually us to distinguish between them in some way and say, okay, what is it that specifically does supplication mean? And that's an older word. We don't use that now, so I can't remember which translation I've used, but you'd have to look at what that meant. Um, what specifically, like, how does... Requests and thanksgiving differ for each, each other because the, there are different nuances there. Is supplication like supplicating until I need them and like be more Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's more um, like um, yeah, bringing something, I think bringing something specific that you're pleading with God about. Yeah, and it could be on behalf of another person interceding for another person or it could be... Um, just something sp specific you got that you want God, what, or God, you want God to do. Um, <clears throat> so uh, another example of words, uh, an old translation, King James. Um, it says, James three thirteen. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. Now, conversation means now talking to one another. Back then, a conversation was your life. So it means out of a good life. So it meant your total behavior. Um, and so a modern translation might mean, might mean your good conduct there. So let me um, don't know if I'm going to say any more examples there. OK, now we're going to look at some translation challenges. <coughs> um, so we talked about two types of love here. And um, in John 21, verses 15 to 19, the English word love, where Jesus is talking to Peter, has got two meanings. Um, two different words, rather. For example, in John 21, <coughs> oh, to that, here, Jesus, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love, do you love agapao, me, more than these? <coughs> Peter, yes, Lord. You know that I love phileo you. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love agapao me? Yes, Lord, do you know that I love phileo you? Simon, son of Jonah, do you love phileo me? Lord, you know all things, you know that I love phileo you. So why are the two different words there? Okay. Okay, well, an older interpretation, which I don't think is as good, would say that agapao love is the good love and phileo love is kind of weak. And so Jesus says, do you love me really strongly? And Peter says, yeah, I like you. And, and Jesus says, do you love me really strongly? And Peter says, yeah, I like you. And then Jesus says, do you like me? And Peter says, I like you. And that's kind of, <coughs> it's sort of, it's a, it's a weak. But <coughs> this is how I would understand it. That phileo love in John, phileo love, is, is um, not something ever considered to be less. 
because the love of the Father is sometimes spoken of in John as phileo love to the Son and to us at one point, but to the Son. So phileo love, <clears throat> uh, I would say, has got more of an intensity in John. It's not just doing it in, in a disinterested way, but it's being more passionate. So Jesus is saying, uh, do you love me? Do you care about me? And John says, um, I'm passionate about you. And so Jesus says again, do you love me? Do you care about me? And John says, and, and so Peter says, I'm passionate about you. And then Jesus, in effect, is restoring him at this point. So Jesus, in a sense, is, is, is accepting his statement. Are you passionate about me? Now, of course, what's happening here is Jesus is Peter denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus is restoring him three times. And so if you don't see this as being a restoration, you end up with all kinds of problems about how you deal with people who've, who've fallen away in, in, in church. You know, can they be restored? And, you know, what is this process? So I wanna, what I want to say from this is that Jesus is fully restoring Peter. And at the end of it, Jesus commissions Peter to be a leader. And so I want to have a very positive understanding of this passage because I think pastorally, if somebody's fallen away, they can be restored. They can be. And so I want to see this not as like Jesus wimping out at the end or allowing Peter to wimp out. This is actually Jesus fully restoring him. So I would understand um, that, that this is supported by the words that phileo here, Jesus is saying, you love me with a passion here. And Peter's saying, yeah, I love you with a passion. Okay, does that make sense? So I'm trying to give you an example here where it might make a difference in our lives. And uh, I think that when you're dealing with somebody who has gone astray spiritually and being restored, this is one of the prime passages of doing it and encouraging us that Jesus not only restores him, but actually gives him uh, responsibilities in the kingdom. Okay, <clears throat> so... Um, I've just given some ex explanation there, which I gave you earlier. Okay, here's another one, which is a difficult one uh, to translate. The same word in the original may be translated by different English words. In Matthew 24, there's a word, mending their nets, mending. In Luke 6, 14, everyone who's perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Romans 9.22, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Galatians, when somebody falls away, restore such a one. The same Greek word, katarizo, is behind the bolded words. It's the same word. Does that mean that when they're mending their nets, they're actually training their nets? No, it doesn't. It just means that the words can be used widely. Just as an English word, bored, can have many different meanings, so can a Greek word. And one of the dangers that we have is importing one of the other words in to this one. Now, mending and restore, you could see a, a connection there, but not really trained. It's a different usage. You could say that train, that train just means to rate ready for use. You could say get ready for service. You could do that. But you don't have to force the same meaning on all of them. Uh, just like with board, we don't have to force a board of directors to be something about food. We don't. The different usages, we don't have to force it. So just be aware of that. And so what you're going to be doing an example shortly, which is going to have um, some words that you may find this is happening with them. Uh, now, one special case is this. There are some words whose meanings have become doctrinal concepts, such as sin, atonement, justification, sanctification. Um, and so they will tend to be used very often by the, the, if they were doctrinal concepts in the New Testament times, they will tend to be used more specifically by the New Testament writers, just because they'd already taken on the meaning. So, so for example, the word save salvation, generally speaking, um, the word it means deliverance from a trouble or calamity, but sometimes it can be used for healing. Um, and uh, so, uh, so um, but ultimately, um, salvation is, to, nowadays, salvation means to be rescued from sin and death. If you said, is, is somebody saved? Uh, 
but not, sometimes it's used for a healing or something else in the scripture. So you just got to be careful that if something is a doctrinal concept now, that we always interpret it in that same way. So, for example, in Hebrews 2.15, it says she'll be saved in childbearing. And some people have said if women want to be saved, they've got to have children. If you don't have children, you're not saved. You know, it's a bizarre idea, but some people have said that. And, and really, you're not misunderstanding that the word saved can mean just be kept physically from, from a, a physical misfortune. So just that's so something to be aware of. Um, so I'm just going to end this by talking about some word study fallacies. Uh, <clears throat> four fallacies. The first, uh, the root meaning fallacy. And the root meaning fallacy is that words have got a root meaning you can pull apart. So if we take automobile, so auto, auto, that's got the root idea of being selfish, hasn't it? Auto means self. So automobile drivers are selfish. Is that right? Is that what it means? It doesn't. It's, it doesn't mean that at all. <clears throat> but you may have heard um, prophecy, somebody saying that the root meaning of prophecy is to bubble up. Well, you just can't do that with the word. You can't say, you know, there is a root here which is something else and we must import that into this word. If you want to find out what the word prophecy means, you just look at the occurrences of how it's used. You don't try and find something else in some, often in some other ancient language that seems to sound similar. So another example of this, slightly different, the pulling a word apart. What does butterfly mean? Can you tell me what butterfly means? Is that what it is? <laughs> Has a butterfly got anything to do with butter? Anything whatsoever? Does it help you understand what a butterfly is with the concept of butter? That maybe it's butter? It doesn't. It doesn't. Some people have suggested that actually originally it was flutter by and it kind of got, I don't know whether that's true, but that's what people, some people have suggested. Now people have done the same thing with some biblical words, ecclesia which um, is the word for church. And they say, well, if we pull it apart, ek means out and klesia means called. So a church means a group of people who are called out of the world and they're gathered together, which sounds very spiritual and holy. The problem with that is that the word ecclesia was used in the New Testament for every kind of gathering. Even the mob was called an ecclesia. When in Acts 19, 32, 39 and and uh, 31, the, the uh, Roman governor uh, talks about the mob as being an ecclesia. So what does it mean? It just simply means a gathering. It simply means people gathered together uh, and as people assembled together. So the emphasis from that on church is you're actually gathered. You're actually physically in the same place. That's the emphasis. You're actually come together. It's not some... Um, some idea of being called out of the world. So that's pulling a word apart, and which people tend to do. Uh, anachronism. Anachronism means something that's uh, in the wrong time. It's, it's happened you know, before or later than it should be. So you may have heard the idea that dunamis means dynamite. Have you heard that? The gospel of God is the dunamis to salvation. It's the dynamite. Has anybody heard that? Okay. Okay. Dunamis simply means power. That's all it means. It simply means power. But when they invented this substance, which was very, very explosive, that was called dynamite. I don't know how long ago it was, but probably at least 100 years ago. They invented it. They said, what are we going to call it? Let's use the Greek word dunamis for power to describe this high explosive. We'll call it dynamite. And so nowadays when people want to explain what dunamis means in the New Testament. They say, well, it means dynamite. But can't you see that's, the, that's taking a word that 1900 years later was applied to a high explosive and then reading it back into the New Testament. The, Paul, the Apostle Paul had got no concept of dynamite when he, when he used that word. It simply means power. It can be used widely for different kinds of power, but it simply means power. When I did a study of dunamis and I found that Almost all occasions in the New Testament meant supernatural power. It meant signs and wonders. So 
Um, Exactly. Exactly. But even then, with dynamite, um, all you're getting is that somebody thought it would be an appropriate word. It doesn't necessarily help you understand the chemical structure of dynamite or anything like that. So um, another one is um, that uh, it, we read, God loves a, a joyful giver. And the word joyful is uh, heleron that's used in the Greek. And I've heard people say, well, you know what? The word hilaron is the word that we get hilarious from. So really what they're saying is that God loves a hilarious giver. <coughs> so, okay, it doesn't, like, it, can, it may be the same word that was originally derived from the Greek, but it's really, it's, it, God loves a joyful giver. Why do you have to, to twist that? So sometimes there's an appeal to very rare and unusual instances. So a word may be used a hundred times and once it's used a particular way. And so people are saying, well, okay, that's how it's used. And you just have to be careful about that. Now, what I'm going to do after the break is going to equip you to do this work yourself in a very quick and easy way to actually first-hand engage with these words. And I think you'll find this is very freeing because you'll no longer be limited to people telling you what this word means. You will be able to see very, very quickly and easily exactly what is behind every word in the New Testament or Old Testament. We're going to focus on the new, but you're going to be able to do this. So I'm going to give you some tools for doing this, and the assignment is going to be do, to do a word study using these tools. So, uh, okay, if we want to switch the film off now. Okay, all right. So uh, before I do that, um, <clears throat> we're going to have to do a pra some practical um, computer installation because I'm going to require you to use some computer tools. And one of the primary questions is what kind of computer you have. Does everybody here have access to a computer? They all do? Now, which you've got a Mac there. Who else uses a Mac? Okay, everybody except you. Okay, that's all right. That's okay, no, because it's much easier if you don't have a Mac, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they did. They got you. However, we have two we have two possible solutions if you don't if you have a Mac. And uh, both of them will work. And so um, do any of you have parallels running? No. You have parallels? Okay. So you can run PC programs. Okay. Um, the other solution is, um, okay, uh, let me just give you a, a very broad outline, then we'll, we'll take our break. Um, there are two ways, there is a program called eSword, which is far and away the best free software uh, for doing Bible work. It's phenomenally rich. I don't know if God has talked about Bible software, but uh, there's a program, this program called eSword. Now, the program is written, it's written native for, um, the PC, but it can be made to run very easily on the Mac. Now I run Linux and I run it on Linux and I use the same technique. There is a, there is a, um, a utility called Crossover which allows it to run on, on other kinds of computers. The only problem with this utility is that it's not free. It's like 29 bucks. But you can get a free 30-day trial for it, and they've done a deal with eSword has done a deal with a discount on it. I think you pay two-thirds of the price if you buy it with, you click through to it from eSword. So that is the best way of doing it. I'll demonstrate that to you. The second best way of doing it is there's a web tool that you can use, which can be a bit cumbersome, but you can do it online without, without uh, the tool. So uh, after the break, we're we'll, we're going to have uh, we're going to do some installation and we'll see. So if you've got a laptop, if you could bring it, and we will see if we can get everybody up and running. Does that sound good? Yep. Okay. So what I want to do actually is to to get so that I can remember everybody. I want to take your photographs on my phone. Is that okay? Can we do that? Okay. Just I, I'm going to make a thumbnail of this so we didn't have to worry too much about. Uh, okay. So I can take you two, you two together. If you just move close, I can do you together. There you go, and I can just, okay. Let me just check I've got my flash on here. Actually, I don't, I'm gonna try without a flash. I don't know if I need a flash. Okay. 
Go on. Okay. That's going. Actually, I'm going to try it with the flash to see if that makes any difference. <laughs>